Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. It has finally arrived. That is right. It is season premiere day around here. Season nine kicking off right now. Okay, not right now. In fact, this little guitar you're hearing in the background, this is courtesy of a good friend of mine named Dayton. Dayton, just want to give you a shout out, man. Thank you for contributing to the show. Super excited about that. But today's episode is super excited because again, kicking off our season nine, Are You Enough? I don't know about anybody else. I think on some level, we all have struggled with this idea of, are we enough? And so this season, we are going to dig deep into that with some amazing guests. And today, I'm just really excited to introduce you to this gentleman. And without further ado, Lucas, take it away. Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do, do something differently, put yourself in other people's shoes, open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Of course, I appreciate it so much every time we get a chance to sit down and chat with so many amazing people coming up this season. Super excited about this season. So if you don't know already, we have started a new season. A new chapter has officially been turned in the book, in the treasure chest, whatever you want to say. The page is turned. And so what better way to turn the page than to cross the ocean of said page? So help me welcome in my guest, hailing all the way from near Stonehenge, some 20 some odd miles. I think it's kilometers. So we're going to have to maybe dig into that a little bit, but help me welcome in my guest today, Ryan. Ryan, how are you? I'm great, my brother. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Really great to be here, my friend. I heard it said years ago from a friend of mine who is down in Texas, by the way, Houston to be specific. He said, when you come across people that chew the same dirt as you and play in the same sandbox, you really should become friends with them. And I was like, I don't know what you mean by chewing the same dirt because dirt to me doesn't sound appealing on any continent. I don't know how you want to respond to that. But but when I came across you on Instagram, I started following you and I thought, man, here is a guy going right back into what my friend Sean says that is chewing the same dirt as I am, that really is out to this this empathetic heart, this this mm. idea of really having the best day ever. You know, is that truly possible in your mind? I want to lead off maybe with that question and get into our, our fun stuff. Oh, a big, deep one. Uh, I- like you, I host a podcast. I've interviewed about 138 people. And I think the biggest takeaway I can, I've can i taken from being with those people is that it is not what happens to us. You know, that so many people have suffered adversity. But the thing that really inspires me is the way that these people have chosen to reframe what that means. And they've used that as a way of fueling their day, fueling their existence. And, and I guess sometimes, you know, so it, it's you got to know the darkness to know the light. And I think, you know, to be, able to, to be able to take all the pain and yet choose to be happy anyway, I think that's a real mark of a, a real strong heart and mind. See, and I think that's powerful mm. to recognize that, yes, the darkness is there, but really still brings some light back into that darkness. I love that so much. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. So of course, before we get down too far down a road together, I got to know this question. Just got to ask it. What size shoes do you wear? (laughs) I'm a UK size 10. Love that. UK size 10. I love that. That's awesome. Good stuff. And what brand or style do we like to wear more than most? Converse. Okay. Any particular type of Converse or the old school Chuck Taylors? Is that what we're rocking? Yeah. Old school Chuck Taylor mid tops. Yeah, very much so. And why that, of, of all things to wear? I mean, you could wear anything, but do you have a reason maybe for those? I just like simplicity. I just, you know, I think I think the image of the guy with just blue jeans, the uh, the Chuck Taylor mid tops, black t shirt, leather jacket, like that's just simplicity for me. I, I don't want to I don't want to get wrapped up in too much thought about what I have to wear every day. I know that's cool. It's crisp. It's timeless. That's it for me. I like it. It's cool. It's crisp. It's timeless. uh, All good things. I'm not saying I'm cool or Chris. I'm just saying. (laughs) Right. I love that too. That's, that's good stuff. So I'm wondering about this. It's evening over, over where you are currently, but I mean, you could have done anything today. Why come on? Why sit with a guy all the way in Oregon? Who's 
obsessed with shoes, who has this crazy obsession with North Carolina, who always is asking people what size shoes they wear. I mean, wh why do that of all things? I guess a couple of things come straight to my mind. And, and one is is exactly what you said about in the in the sandbox is about we, we share a heart. We, you know, people talk about like-minded. I, I talk about like-hearted and, and our mission of bringing more empathy in the world. You use the word empathy. I use the word love. We, we share a similar heart for, for trying to make a positive difference in the world. And, I, and I'm sure that you and I both share this belief that when leaders become more empathetic, when leaders become more loving, everything around them gets better. Families, communities, businesses, um, they get better. So uh, the, the minute you, you reached out, it was a no-brainer. We share the same mission. Second thing for me is that I, I made a commitment that it is you know, it's one day at a time. It's one person at a time, every, you know, one opportunity at a time. I, I think so many people have a vision and belief of changing the world, but don't realize that that takes time and devotion to a single idea and and the in the willingness to talk about that with you know with anybody who'll listen and and I just appreciate the fact that you you thought that my idea was worthy of, of more discussion um and I had a third one but I'll leave it at that I love that though because here's the thing I mean you know this as a host that it is maybe you do maybe you don't I think it's extremely challenging to find people to not only find people but it's extremely hard to find people that you feel are going to come on and are going to have a reason and and not just come on and, and have a giant infomercial if you will you know that that really want to come on and share heart and share concept and share hey here's where i've been here's where i'm going you know kind of idea yeah and i think that to me is what spawned this new chapter or new season whatever you want to call it of having people answer this question are you enough now i know for you you know, you're a dad, you're a podcaster, you're, you're doing all these amazing things across the pond over in Great Britain. Has there ever been that moment in your, in your life or in your journey that you've really struggled with the idea of, you know, am I really enough? Am I really doing enough? Am I really enough for my kids? Am I really enough for my wife? You know, am I enough? And if so, maybe elaborate on that. I mean, I, I'll take you back if I can. I, I would never have used the words enough. I mean, that wouldn't have registered on me. But um, when I was child, um, my mum and dad separated when I was six months old. So my dad left when I was six months. I didn't really have a male role model. Stepdad, mum remarried, had a stepdad. Um, and at the age of 12, mum sits me down in the bedroom. She cries on my shoulder. I'm a man of the house at this point because she's just told me that she's no longer in love with my stepdad and she's leaving. So I think that sparks my empathy journey. You know, I, I think that moment, if I look back at, pivotal moments in my life that was a huge thing for a 12 year old to try and be you know and, and i and i from that moment on uh, i've always had this desire to relieve people of emotional pain you know and and, and for a young lad that didn't have a male role model that just meant that i became the class clown it, it just meant that I became uh, the flaws that I have now. I've come to look back at my teenage years with a bit of empathy and a bit of, oh, bless, he tried. Because my flaws is that I, I deeply seek love and validation in the world because I didn't have it growing up. So I'm okay now because I love myself deeply. But when I have bad days, it immediately goes to where's Ryan seeking his love and validation in the world. And, and I wouldn't say it's not enough because I know I, 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 my heart knows that I am enough as a husband, as a parent, and, and that I deserve to love and be loved. But it's those days, particularly in my early teens, um, early twenties, I had this label of being arrogant, you know, and I, I would, fight it so hard I'm not arrogant you don't know me the the young lad that was desperate for validation would go around telling people all the great things he was doing all the amazing things that he was doing he was the first member of his family going off to university so he sounds like a bit of an arrogant so and so the reality is he just wanted someone to say that they were proud of him and that they love him unconditionally. So it's those moments where I felt like I, I needed to become something worth loving I guess is probably how I'd do it but you know, I'm very fortunate. I've spent you know most of my twenties uh, on this leadership development journey, which starts with self. It starts with the self exploration, and you know, I, I I'm very. It's taken a lot of work, but I, I love myself deeply. You know, and I and I give myself as much as I need every single day because I've come to the realization that when I do that, I become better for everybody who needs me. You know, there are moments when I didn't look after myself. And I become the worst version of me. I become unlovable. And so goes the cycle of the neediness and the seeking love and validation. So I've learned if I put myself first, I become better for those who need me. And I become less, see, try and lead from love. 
rather from lack. That's wonderful to, to think about and even articulate. There is still, I feel like some pain there for sure. Mm. When you talk back to that now, you know, I know in the States here, we have that amazing movie back to the future. You've probably seen it. Michael J. Fox. I'm sure it made it over there. I, I hope it did. If it didn't really, this might fall flat, but, but maybe a, a better no, analogy for you is Dr. Who. Now I myself, I'm not a big Dr. Who fan. You know, I do know that he goes into that what is it? The police thing? What do you guys call those? I, I don't even know. Help me with oh, the, TARDIS. the TARDIS. Right, right, right. So it goes in the TARDIS and he can yeah. go back in time and he can go forward in time and he can go anywhere he wants, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we were to get into the proverbial TARDIS for you and go back in time to say around, you know, seven years old, maybe we find you playing, you know, cricket or something. I, I don't know. I'm really drawn <laughs> on my, my London things here, which is maybe you don't even play cricket. I don't know. Maybe you play baseball. I don't know. I play a, a, a real sport, my friend. I play rugby, you know, without... The no, I was just going to say, I was actually <laughs> just going to say, I was like, maybe we're playing rugby. Maybe we catch you in between, you know, the, the rugby game. But if we were to find you at seven years old or, or maybe even 13 years old, mm -hmm. what do you think you would tell that back self, that younger Ryan, about the pain and about everything that's going to come forward in his life? I've come to realize that sometimes love doesn't try and fix. Love love just sits with and listens. And I'd sit alongside that young lad and I'd just listen and I'd let him cry his heart out. And I'd smile at him and I'd just say, this is going to be your fuel. Everything that you become and everything that you want to be in the future, you're going to get that and more. And this, you know, I'm a man of faith now. I was never, I never wanted to be a man of faith. I was a man of science, but maybe we'll talk about the transformation a bit later, but I... I've come to realize that like Paul with the thorns in his flesh, he can pray for those to be removed as much as he wants. But in, in that weakness, he is made strong. And I've come to realize that I can't love who I am now and want to change anything that's happened in my life. So I would simply sit with that lad and say, this is going to be fuel to your fire. And this is going to make your heart bigger than you can ever imagine. And you're going to impact many people because it's going to have a purpose. The question I always have to ask is, would he listen to you in that moment, though? He'd want to know exactly how it's going to go. He'd want to know the three things that he needs to do to make that happen. Like When I say man of science, he was also a control freak. He wanted to know that if he did A, B, and C, that is going to equal D, E, and F, right? And and this is, this is where sometimes... I really used to struggle with the paradox of it is what it is because it will always be what I make it. You know, I was such a, this comes from my mum. My mum was so positive, optimistic, can do attitude. And, and I guess I've just got that stubbornness that I felt like I was in control of more than what I actually was up until the point where we try and control stuff that's far beyond our reach and it causes pain. And, you know, and, and this whole faith story, you know, 2019 was that year of pain for me, marital struggle, work clashes and issues, health struggle, when stuff gets hard and, and when I feel that people are going to leave, you know, I do, I, I, I either take myself off the table and become emotionally unavailable or I work, I work harder and harder and harder. And I got to a point where that just wasn't possible anymore in 2019. And God, out of, God, rather than me pursuing God, he had a sense of humor and he pursued me <laughs> until I listened, until I was on my knees. Um, but yeah, that young lad would have wanted to know exactly what he needed to do to get the exact outcome that he desired. But I always struggle with that idea of my younger self. And I know it's weird talking third person and <laughs> going back in time and space time continuum and butterfly mm -hmm. effect and all this mm -hmm. other stuff that, you know, comes into play with that question because people are always like, it's not reality. You you can't go back in time and you shouldn't have your should have, would have, could have's and what ifs. And I'm like, I know, but it's still fun to think back. You know, they're with us. They're with us now. They are. You know, we 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 carry those feelings in our body. If we've into terms and realization with those emotions, then that young boy is probably still with me. Well, I heard it said years ago by a pastor that we all have the younger version of ourselves still inside. The little boy is still inside of me, just like the little boy is still inside of you. The little yeah. girl is still inside my wife. The little girl is probably mm -hmm. still stuck inside your wife somewhere in some respects. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it was said to me and I kind of like it. We'll, we'll press forward. So going back to your story and going back to your kind of, I found God moment. <laughs> do you think that in that moment gave you more of a validation of who you are 
Or do you think that gave you more of, of an inkling that I, I do matter because there is somebody higher than me that does love me? Maybe speak to that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I, I guess I'll give full context to the story. I, I mean, my wife and I were, were running businesses um, on side of day jobs. My net, wife is a network marketer. She had a team of 300 women selling um, unique makeup products, which is incredible. I had this passion for leadership and coaching and I started to do a little bit of, of that. And, and I, so I just spent time in this office coaching um, her downline. I'd spent and time coaching her ladies. They think they were coming to me for kind of business mentorship around how to sell mascara in, in <laughs> inevitably would end up talking about confidence mindset um, and uh, discipline and, and these sort of things. But we threw ourselves into our work so much that our relationship suffered. We weren't being who we needed to be for each other. And with two very young kids as well, I, we just didn't look after each other. I got to a point where I just, I lost hope in the future and I moved out. So I moved back to my mum's and I was living in this bedroom that was my bedroom from being a kid, but it was redecorated. It looked like, you know, this lampshade, it looked like it was from Beauty and the Beast. It could come alive at any moment. You know, it's awful. It was, it was awful. But just before I left, the important thing is my wife had said that she found God and she said, I think you need to find him too. You know, you need to go and find him too. And I, I'm a man of science at this point. And there's me thinking the hierarchy of kids come first, then me. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, this God's leapfrogged me. And he's, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not competing with this guy. I can't compete with this guy. I'm out. But while I was away, every time I used to get in the car to go to work, there was this um, British pop girl, girl band, Sugar Babes. And um, they haven't been around for 10 years. Um, and I've never heard this song. But every day I got in the car, it was, can we bring yesterday back around? Because I know how I feel about you now. And it was like the first three days I was haunted by this song. I was like, not again. Stop it. And come the end, come day 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm starting to smile. My heart is starting to soften. And then, you know, come another week or so, we we put our own egos to one side and we start to have a more healing uh, conversation, a much more grace-filled conversation that we'd ever had for each other. In deciding to go again, I committed to going to a Christian festival. Um, bear in mind, man of science. The idea of spending my weekend with 40,000 Christians who I just perceived would be like being with like Ned Flanders. I like, you know, I was like, I don't want anything to do with this. And I went and I'm a people watcher. And I sat there this weekend and I'm watching these inc these people having their, their moments of prayer or just worship, all walks of life. And I love authenticity. I love people being who they're made to be and expressing themselves. So I see people full arms extended in the middle of fields. And I'm like, this is cool. I really like this. And then some of the lyrics were just pounding on me. Like, you know, some some band introduced a song that so this goes out to the father of the fatherless. I'm like, oh man, I'm listening. <laughs> you know, I'm listening. It was, you know, some of the lyrics just, they just, it, it, God got to me through music because it, it gave me a private way to listen without my wife going, oh, I see you're reading the Bible. <laughs> I see, told you. Told you so, told you you needed God in your life. I'd go away and listen to a few worship songs on the way to work and stuff, and I'd just cry in my car. Anyway, I didn't tell anyone that because I didn't want people knowing. But we went to a local church, and the pastor said, um, it, was, it was Father's Day. He said, oh, come down the front. You know, men, men come to the front. It's just a harmless kind of commissioning. We just want to say some nice words over the fathers. I thought, oh, what's the worst that can happen? I'm a father. Why not, right? <laughs> so I go down the front of this church, incredible church, um, right here. And um, it's part of the Vineyard Movement. And um, yeah, the pastor just said, that's it, women. If you want to reach out your hands towards these men, you do that. And with that, it was like I was hadoukened in the back. All I felt was like street fighter, ball of fire in the bottom of my spine, whole body caught fire. And my eyes just streamed. <laughs> I'm like, I walked back to Lisa, my wife, and I just said, I don't want to talk about this ever again. <laughs> I said, I just want to say I'm a child of God. I feel like a child of God, and I don't want to talk about this ever again. And that, from that day, I've never been able to muster an, an, uh, an ounce of angst towards any male role model in my life. You know, if you want to use the word healed, like, I don't know. I'm not sure what happened, but peace. And that's just, you know, that was two years ago. And since then, I've made a commitment just to learn more, you know, about what it means to to follow God. Jesus was a great character for me before I came to faith. I really liked his leadership style. But the more I get to know that guy, the more I get to, the more I, my heart for showing up and trying to live, love and lead the way that he did is, 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 is just has been life giving. It's been absolutely life giving. Live, love and lead the way he did. That's that's good mm. stuff there. I love that too. So my dad is a former Marine. Those who, who listen to the show know this. But one thing, he, he didn't give me a ton of stuff growing up. 
he was always gone, always, you know, defending the United States of America and, you know, both enemies, both foreign and domestic, the whole, the whole nine yards. But one thing he always instilled in me was this phrase, do it better than you did yesterday. <laughs> And so again, co- going back to you, right? When I came across your saying of always better than yesterday, I was like, wait, so similar <laughs> to what my dad would say. So I, I got to ask this question, like where on earth does that come from? And, and where does that resonate down deep inside of you? Okay, I'll try to make this as clear as possible. So when I first started coaching, I was coached myself and uh, my coach asked me 10 times one question. She said, what is important to you about being a coach? And on that day, One of my answers was, I love helping people be better than they were yesterday. And it's never left me. I've loved the phrase and and it's never left me. And and it became the the community that I had kind of to all these women from the network marketing company. I I got to a point where I helped so many that I just started putting us all in this little community so that we can learn and grow and collaborate together. And and I guess in the early days, I was a mindset coach. And so mindset, the, the way that mindset looks always better than yesterday is about being a lifelong learner about learning more about ourselves, learning more about others, learning more about our skill sets so that we can ultimately be better at what we do. That was when things are going really well. But and I think there are two paths to purpose. One is passion. And my passion for helping people is what got me started. I was doing this alongside my job at the police force in here in the UK. I was a civilian. I was uh, a number of different roles from being a 999 call handler to a dispatcher. And I eventually ended up as like one of the head of um, analysis type departments. But alongside that, I was coaching and I was sharing my heart and my mind for leadership. I I really fell in love with the concept of leadership and I got judged pretty hard. You know, the senior leaders were sat around with my social media profile going, what does Ryan Hartley know about leadership? You know, and and it brought up everything from the past because here's here's a young man again. Well, here's the kid who doesn't feel like he belongs, doesn't feel like he matters, doesn't feel like he can express himself. So it really triggered me. And, And in that so the, the second path to purpose is pain. And I love helping people avoid the pain with which I've once experienced, which is to help people feel like they matter, to help people feel like they belong, to help people feel like they've got someone in their corner that tries to bring out their potential, is proud of them. And the best way that I can help that happen in the world is to help leaders who care to help leaders who lead with love. Because when a leader leads with love, they're going to create a safe space for people to come and do their best work. They're going to feel like they matter and they belong. So that's that's what Always Better Than Yesterday means to me now is that before it was the process, whereas now it's, it, it's the outcome. It, my wife sometimes feels triggered by the phrase because sometimes it feels like if you're a perfectionist, or Always Better Than Yesterday feels like the cost of entry. Whereas for me, I've come to realize that always better than yesterday is simply the result of being led by love. Is there a danger if we're not being led by love in your mind? Well, yes, because so often the world leads with its mind. Um, and the mind is a flawed, the mind is great. The mind is, is in part why humans are one of the most civilized, uh, organized societies, but we put too much value on it. It's flawed in its sense because there are hashtag mindset is everything. But if we don't, engage the heart first we might achieve great things but this is that penguins of madagascar moment where we look around and go oh well this sucks i've got the job i've got the house i've got the money i don't really like myself a lot my kids don't really like me my wife's resentful she's only sticking around because of the mortgage um i don't really like my job i don't enjoy it that much i feel stuck because of the pension on the outside you look like a success highly paid job you got two cars you go on vacations but if you've not been led by love and you've not engaged your heart first it's not really success but do you think there's there's ever a danger for you following your heart? The good book says the heart can be deceitful beyond all things. Right? So what we really have to check and test ourselves is where is the posture of our heart? And if our heart desires stuff, earthly things, I'm not saying that's inherently bad, but we have to understand where those desires come from. Because when we lead with our heart, we don't desire anything. We come to the world, Proverbs says, we lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. If we can put that into our heart set and can combine it with what Peter says about the gifts that we have, we are meant to serve others in the world with that, then our heart can simply be about expressing itself. If we follow our heart, express ourselves by loving others, loving ourselves, using the gifts that we've been given, then I think we can never go wrong. If we posture our heart on things and belonging in in places that are external to us, we always leave ourselves vulnerable. Yeah, I think that could be a danger, right? If we Mm. 
again, if we're focused on the material, and I think we know this deep down, I know this deep down, like if I focus so much on the material and not the person, then obviously I'm going to be deceived every time and I'm going to be led astray every time. But there is a danger, I think, sometimes in in loving because there's that idea that, right, mm. I, if I'm going to love you genuinely, I know we just met, but if I'm going to love you genuinely and I'm going to have your best interest at heart genuinely, mm-hmm. there's a trust factor there that I'm going to trust that you're not going to hurt me. Mm. How do you avoid that of getting hurt from that? <laughs> Uh, coming from a guy that would immediately shut down emotionally or take himself off the table if he got slightest wind of not being the one that he was chosen. <laughs> he's a kid that wants to be chosen. And if he gets wind that he's not going to be, he's not available. <laughs> so yeah, how do you avoid it? <laughs> I don't know how you avoid it, but you certainly don't fear it um, because fear is not the energy we, we should live in. And, and and this is where the importance of trying to, this is this now we're getting to the heart of self-love. Self-love is not hedonistic. It is not pleasure for pleasure's sake. It is for the very difficult things like this conversation. It is, how can I love you anyway, regardless of how you respond to me? One of my favorite authors, Bob Goff, he wrote a book called Love Does which shows that love is a verb, it's action. But it's also, his other book is Everybody Always. And it responds to the question, who should I love and how often? Everybody, always. And in it, he says, there are some really difficult people to love. There are some really difficult people to love. So we have to first fill ourselves with that unconditional love. Uh, Someone here in the UK said to me once, being a Christian is like being a day glow t-shirt. You hold it up to the sunlight. And then when it gets dark, it continues to glow for other people. And I think sometimes that's where we have to go to the word. We have to go to God within ourselves, the moment, you know, be still, breath work, and realize that the power of, you know, <laughs> the power of creation is within us and then fight every human instinct that it's going to take to not want that love reciprocated. I'm thinking about back to, you know, you being in your younger years Yep. you know, playing rugby. I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this is universal, right? Everybody lines up, you know, horizontal line and you got two captains out there in the field and they're like, okay, I'm going to take Johnny. I'm going to take Billy. I'm going to take, you know, Ernesto. I'm going to take, you know, whoever, mm. Julio, I'm going to take Hector. I'm going to take this guy. I'm going to take, you know, maybe we had some, I don't know, girls, maybe it's go ahead. I don't know. I'm only, only naming boy names, <laughs> but it's coming down to like the last three people, right? We got, you know, Jason and, Okay, Jason gets picked, and now it's down to you, Ryan, and Toby. Mm. And they're like, okay, I'll take Toby. And now it's just Ryan. They're like, oh, here we go. I guess I'll take Ryan. I mean, that's what I hear you say in those moments is that in life it feels like a lot like the playground back in the day, that it's all about how we're being chosen. So how do you get around that idea that you're the last picked? How does that resonate with you, and how do you counteract that? when those thoughts come in. So so as a kid, uh, I would have displayed behaviors that meant that I was never last picked. I would befriend people who weren't necessarily good people to be around. I would be a joker. I'd like to make people laugh. I would do things to make sure that I was never last picked. And I was a liked, I, you know, I was a liked guy, but I put myself in positions and circles where I would probably be exposed, um, doing inappropriate things, setting bushfires, for example, not entirely great behavior, but I did it around groups of people because I wanted to fit in and belong, you know? So that that's that's how the deceitful heart can lead us astray. Because if you dis, if if my heart desired belonging, well, I'm belonging in a in a in a in a in a in a group or a community that is fundamentally uh, not what I would choose. But I put myself there anyway. As a as an adult, we, we got to come to a position where we fight the human instincts of competition. When somebody chooses somebody else, they're not. It doesn't have to be a a loss for me. I try and find as much win win as I possibly can, and, and it fights that instinct of when when somebody else chooses to listen to somebody else's podcast, does your instinct say, why aren't you listening to mine? And you have to try and fight that and and override that and just be happy. And I I have to try and create that happiness in myself because like, like I said in Proverbs, I lack nothing. I have all that I need. I have to start trying to act and believe and, 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 and work in ways that demonstrate that on the outside, be happy when people are winning, remove myself from any element of by, you know, people feeling like it's a competition. I, I, I do work with um, heart math. And what they say is that when we get our 
heart and our mind into a state of coherence when the uh, heart rhythm and the brain waves are aligned we raise our frequency we raise our energy um, to more states of love kindness compassion collaboration these these are our natural states but when we're put into these environments where it's kill or be killed it's competition it's performed to you know uh, it, it drags us down from that state and, and ultimately, we're less healthy. Our leadership is less, less healthy for it. But I think that's the challenge we run into is mm. everything mm. in life comes down to a competition. It comes down to a competition as parents, I would imagine. I'm a parent myself. Mm -hmm. My wife is amazing. My daughter's pretty cool. But right now, my daughter's at that stage of life of 14 that she wants to hang out with mom more because, <laughs> you know, she can relate with mom more because they're both girls. I'm not a girl. Mm. You know, so that's a that's a tough conversation, right? But I think everything comes down to this idea of a competition. We're competing against somebody. We're competing. You mentioned podcasters. You know, I mean, everyone I know seems like nowadays has a podcast. It's almost like what you don't have a podcast. It's almost weird mm -hmm. to me when I meet someone that says, oh, I'm thinking about starting or I'm this or I'm that, you know, but it does. It comes down to the number one question I always get asked is, you know, when someone says, oh, well, you have a podcast. Well, how many downloads do you have? How many how many subscribers do you have? Well, how many episodes do you have? Mm -hmm. Like everything's a competition, you know, and, and I'm in a sales industry now where everything is all about the numbers, about who sold this and who sold mm -hmm. that. And so for you, how do you not get on that hamster wheel of competition? Well, they can measure the size of my audience, but they can't measure the size of my heart and they can't measure the ripple of my impact. So I, 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 there are moments when I know that if I'm looking at those numbers, I'm tired. And I know that I, get, I need to give myself a little talking to because I know that that's not important, but I'm being dragged into a world that leads with lack that's making me feel like that's important. When I'm at my best, I know that I get to sit behind this mic because I love it. And I remind myself that I get to have great conversations with great people why first and foremost because i've got curious questions that i want to hear the answers to and for as long as i feel like i love it keep doing it and if i have the bonus of one person getting the benefit from it then that should be enough and I, if that was my commitment on day one then three years later if i'm feeling sorry for myself because my listeners have gone down you remember where you started that was very profound no one could see but i was doing the mind blown like gesture i needed a i need a sound effect we can get that on the roadcast with the mind blown uh, sound effect but the only problem is i don't want a guest to lose their train of thought when they hear the sound effect so but I'm serious, like that was profound to me because I, I do think there is a danger if you, I, whoever, the proverbial we, I hate the we because it really needs to be about me in some moments, mm -hmm. but I hate it when I get into that mindset as well of like, who's listening? Who's not? Oh my gosh, I only had so many today. Oh, you yeah. know, woe is me. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, like you get down on that. And the idea that you are really just doing it because you want to do it and you love doing it. That to me was so, uh, it was very mm -hmm. profound. Very profound. So so you know that my guest in February is Matthew McConaughey, right? And uh, so what happens after that interview? Who are you getting next? Who are you getting next? Who are you getting next? And do you know what? I, I had to just, uh, and, and I was at peace. I didn't need anybody else. I didn't need anything. I didn't lack anything. I didn't need to chase anything because I had to remind myself that I was this <laughs> was this, I was this lad from the southwest of England that had a simple idea, was brave enough to share that with the world, and had the audacity to think it was even possible to get Matthew McConaughey on his podcast. Like, I was super proud of who I'd become. I didn't need anything else. Uh, but the way that the world works is next. What's next? What's next? What's next? And it takes away from the enjoyment and the awe and wonder of what even happened. I do think that is the danger. The danger in life is when, mm. you know, I, I've been guilty of this, so I'm confessing on my own show sometimes, but I've been guilty of this. Like Happens. I always think, okay, well, who's next? I don't take time to really enjoy mm -hmm. the person who I'm sitting with sometimes because I'm always in my mind thinking five, six, seven episodes down <laughs> the way, like, okay, I have this person now who's next and who's next and who's next. And that's part of the reason why the map came into play for me is because now I can look back over the map and go, okay, wow, I sat with Ryan. That was a fantastic time. And I can have mm -hmm. my own moment back mm -hmm. with that guest again, you know? And that's the joy of podcasting really is you can theoretically go back and hear past episodes and be like, wow, that, 
that really was a good interview or man, I really did struggle with those questions or man, I need to get better Mm. at, you know, whatever it may be. And, and instead of getting wrapped up into the technical aspect of it, like, Oh, that, that show only got seven downloads. Wow. Uh, Hopefully you got more than seven on Matthew, but anyway, so back to you. So I want to give you an opportunity right now to really just share, you know, I know you guys have this stadium out there. I think you've heard of it. Wembley stadium. Familiar with that? I don't know. A lot of mm-hmm. events happen there, maybe. <laughs> it's a big stadium. Now, have you seen any concerts there at Wembley, by the way? Just asking for a friend. Yeah, I've seen Oasis. I've seen Muse. Oasis my favorite band of all time, but not everybody's cup of tea. Are you talking like the Wonderwall <laughs> Oasis? Am I, am I getting that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, all that's right. it. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. That that did make it over here. So there we go. I um I saw the second uh NFL Wembley. So when the Dolphins and the uh Chargers came up, not Chargers, is the New Orleans Saints. I'm pretty sure it was that set it was the second one, which is great because I'd never been able to go to an NFL game before that. So So would England be able to support an NFL team, do you feel like? I mean, I know this is way off topic, but just wondering in your mind. Well, yeah, the the only thing is about why do your games last so long? I ain't got the patience to sit down for like four hours. I mean, rugby's up and it's intense. It's done within 80 minutes. Like, you know, I I think if we were able to experience like the tailgate parties and and, and have a community around it, and whereas over here, it's kind of a bit later in the evening. It's not really your average Sunday evening kind of, but hey, I'd definitely love to experience the culture of of being around it. That's for sure. Well, we have, you, you have done something that I've never done. I've never been to an NFL game. So there you go. Oh, yeah, go. I've been to lots of basketball games, but never, never a uh, NFL game. So maybe this year, maybe I'll get up to a Seahawks game. So yeah, man, I'll, I'll come yeah, with you. There we go. So I'm thinking of Wembley Stadium, right? I'm thinking of this amazing capacity crowd on hand, mm-hmm. right? Just amazing packed out stadium. And I'm wondering this, like, what would you say? Center field, I, I don't know. Is there such a thing as center field in rugby? That tells you how much I know about rugby. Not much. Mm. But is there like a center moment where we hand you a microphone and you just talk to this amazing crowd? And what would you say to them? I'd walk on at the halftime show, I think. So uh, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, there was um, England uh, in the European Championships. They made it to the final. First time we made a final in 50 years, right? And th- there's this talk that say that men aren't very emotional. Men aren't good with emotions. Will you stick a man in of all emotion they sing songs they cry when they win they cry when they lose so there's no such thing as men can't be emotional they just need to find things that they care about they need to find things that they're passionate about so what i'd say at the halftime show is that the amount of love and passion and energy you put into 11 men kicking a ball around the room uh, around the field find something that makes you feel like that in your life find and do things that make you feel like that because you're going to feel better. You're going to enjoy your life more. You're not going to need to go and do things that that, that become bad habits. You, you're going to be better for those who need you. Um, and, and you never know, we might, we might get families, communities, teams, organizations full of people who actually love what they do. And I think that's really the key, don't you, is really finding that mm-hmm. passion lane and really yeah. running towards it and really inspiring other yeah. people to join you in that lane, right? Yeah, I think so. But it's unique to everybody. You know, it's unique. You know, the gifts you have are very gift- different to the ones I've been given. Our job is just to is to bring ours into the world and, you know, and, and, and find a space where we can contribute those gifts. And I think the reason love is important and, and doing what you love in leadership is really important is because leadership's really tough it requires sacrifice there are moments when things get tricky things get difficult you know in all walks of business right and the reason we don't get the leaders that we deserve is because they didn't sign up for the love model of leadership they signed up for the rank the position the status the hierarchy the money they signed up for the closest parking spot nearest the building so when the going gets tough they're like i'm going to save myself which is the cardinal sin of leadership because you've got to look after your team. So I think people who engage their heart and do what they love, they're, they're connected on something bigger than just themselves. You know, no greater gift as man than to lay down his, his life for, you know, those he loves. Well, that can apply to our work. That can apply to our mission and our impact and our audience, or it can apply to um, our teams at work. 
it's entirely possible that we just first have to find out what we care about so much that it's worth sacrificing for. What do you think about this phrase? Leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about motivating them to do it. What comes to mind when you hear that? Yeah, I mean, the, the ultimate question is, do they follow you because they have to or because they want to? And I think no one really wants to be told what to do. I mean, I certainly don't. I'm terrible at being told what to do because I just, and uh, I'm slowly having the realization this is where my six-year-old daughter gets it from. (laughs) But people are adults. People, you know, Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive. He says that people are motivated by three things. Autonomy, which is about being in control of your destiny, being able to make decisions. Mastery, which is the ability to get better. And purpose is about having it mean something. So I think if you can create an environment where the, those three things are present, you, you don't really have to tell people what you do. Yes, you can coach and you can nurture, and but ultimately, you, you know, you show the way and you empower. Uh, that's such a cliche word, em- empower, but it what it really means is that the power is with them as opposed to being overpowered. Yeah, I just think that's so profound to say, again, empowering somebody is so easy to do in some respects. I mean, mm-hmm. it's easy to give somebody some empowerment. Like, here's a <laughs> cool quote, go read that. Here's an amazing book, go read that. But really walking alongside of them arm in arm and say, no, you got this. And to really, you know, walk, as I said, arm in arm, locked together to do it. I think so. Uh, and I think sometimes, Sometimes we get the catchphrase and the buzzword of empowerment and it's really used quite lazily. So so a senior manager might say, you're empowered to make these decisions, but they haven't spent the time equipping them with the knowledge, skills or experience that they would require to. So they're basically saying is, this is your responsibility and you've not done it and I'm going to hold you to account and I'm going to be. Whereas whereas a leader who you know leads in other people's shoes, they're going to take a perspective of their team and go, right, this is ultimately what I need you to do. What can I do to serve you, to help you? you do these things. Oh, well, I'm going to need to know more about the process. I'm I'm going to need to know more about the what the customer wants or need. Great. Well, now I can start serving what you need. Or maybe I, I haven't had this training course. Maybe I need to do it. Great. I'll give you everything that you possibly need. Any more questions? Great. Off you go. Now you're empowered is the difference. Me just saying you're empowered doesn't make it so. Yeah. Again, I could say you're empowered all you want, but if I'm not giving you and equipping you, <laughs> it's really... As you said, a buzzword or a cool bumper sticker to put on your car. It's really, really nothing else other than that. want to give you an opportunity right now. So how can people hear more about you, your coaching, the podcast? How can they uh, reach out to you and and get connected with you? Thanks, mate. Yeah, my my website is ryanhartley.co.uk. That's got all the good links to uh, our community, our our YouTube and our our podcast. Um, At Ryan B. Hartley on on Instagram and and our Facebook community is We Are Always Better Than Yesterday. So just surrounded by like-hearted people from all around the world. Come as you are and hopefully leave a little bit better. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Ryan. I do appreciate it. So we're going to play a game together because games are fun, right? Yeah, man. Let's do it. Okay. Games are fun. I'm not sure what they taught you over in the UK because, you know, I've never been over there for school. I'm just imagining that they did teach you about the senses, right? The the senses that we have in the body, right? I hope. Yep. Okay. Do you know how many we have roughly? Just ballpark guess. Five. Good. Okay. Good. Five senses. That's what I think we have. Yeah, okay. Some people have been some people have been trying to tell me like we have seven, we have ten. One person told me three. You know, I'm just like I don't even know where we are right now. Yeah. So anyway, so we're gonna play this game called Senseless. Now I know you are not a big Tar Heels fan because we've been, probably never been to England to play basketball, but you probably have heard of somebody that played there, right? Just this is not part of the game. Just help me with this. Do you know anybody that maybe played at the University of North Carolina? Just a guess. Wait, wait, is that where Jordan was from? That is correct. That is where Michael Jordan played. Good oh, job. I yes. <laughs> Oh, that was stressful. I was like, all right, so we're going to play this game called Senseless. So here we go. I'm going to roll Save for you. Save the last dances. Yeah, that, that was a good show, right? Did you watch yeah. that one? Yeah. That was a good flick. It just bailed me out the eyes. Yeah. So you got this number right here it is a number four. So there we are. So what is a sound or noise you love to hear? I have tinnitus. Um, so my ears continuously ring. And if I could get away with it every night, I would listen to thunderstorms because it just takes my focus away from it. And I just love a good thunderstorm. I, they don't happen. as we, we went to Florida a few years ago and honestly, they get some serious thunderstorms. But over here, they're like quite timid. So I, I definitely, it would be thunderstorms. I was in Florida back in August in, at Disney World. And sure enough, while we're in Disney, mm-hmm. <laughs> it starts raining and storming and rides are getting shut down because there's thunderstorms in the forecast. And we got back to our uh, Airbnb that night. And sure enough, it had skylights, which I was grateful for because wow. we, were, we were laying in bed and all of a sudden we would hear and hear it and then see the lightning <sighs> coming through the skylight. So good. It was pretty cool, but it was a blue, which was weird. 
out here in Oregon, I don't think our lightning is blue. So I don't know if Florida has blue lightning. Somebody can tell me or let me know about that. So, but anyway, Ryan, I just want to say, man, thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. You gave up some of your evening say for us. And so just want to say thank you again, man, for coming on. No, man, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to many more great conversations, my friend. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, I appreciate that. Are you enough? Now, maybe you asked yourself that yesterday. Okay. Am I really enough? And then you kind of forgot about it, but I'm going to ask you this question one more time, just because I think it's bears repeating. Are you really enough? And are you really going to be better than what you were yesterday? Because I believe my friend Ryan came on today and told us all about some very practical ways that you can go and do that. Now, I know some of us, we hear self-care, we hear self-talk, we hear self things like that. We immediately like shut down because we think we have to have this like proverbial incense candle and this, you know, wave music coming in, spa music as I call it. He didn't mention any of those things for the record. If, if you want to go back and rewind, you, you can because he did. But I do want to ask you this question that maybe you're struggling with. Maybe you were, in fact, the last kid pit. Maybe you were. Okay. So if you were, ask yourself this question. Why am I still allowing myself to be that last kid pit? And am I enough? Am I more than what I am? And I think you are. In fact, I know you are. So my challenge for you this week is this. I want you to sit down, blank sheet of paper, and just start asking yourself these questions. Am I enough? And just keep writing it. Am I enough? Am I enough? And I think eventually things are going to start to matriculate into your mind to say that you really are. You're going to look around the world that you are in and you're going to start to realize that you have some pretty amazing people that maybe you've just forgotten about. So let that be your challenge this week as we wrap up today. And I just want to remind you of this before we go. And that's this. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we again walk in other people's shoes. Thank you.